I worked for Treadway for a year. And, uh, uh, then um, uh, worked for Manassian for about a year. So that would have been about, yeah, 61, something like that. And um, I subscribed to Architectural Record. No, well, yeah, it was a, or Progressive Architecture. I forget which one. Progressive Architecture, probably. And they had an article on this tower that they were going to build in Seattle. And John Graham and Company had a little rough sketch of what they were thinking about. And um, Manassian uh, had done the gantry for the uh, Saturn launch in Florida. And also had done a bunch of tall uh, TV towers and all kinds of towers on Mount Wilson and stuff like that. So, I was, you know, when they talk about a tower, well, it got my attention, you know. So the next day, in fact, it was the next day in the office, we had a phone call and in a five man office, there's no secretary. So, whoever, you know, was near the phone when it rings, you pick it up in Manassian Associates or John Manassian's office. And, and the uh, guy says, well, I'm, in, I'm Al Fast from the John Graham and Company. I'd like to talk to John Manassian. So immediately I recognize John Graham Company's name and this thing that I just read. And I went in and knocked on John's office door and told him, I said, John, we have a call here from uh, Al Fast, John Graham Company. Closed the door, walked out, and I told the guys, we're going to do the Space Needle. <laughs> and that was from that time till the fair opened was 13 months <laughs> when did you sleep <laughs> <laughs> we, we put in a lot of overtime and we had other jobs in the office too you know I mean that wasn't the only thing that we were working on so okay. but that that had definitely had priority so, um, yeah, we, we put in a lot of time, and... Um, so what, when you say we, the five-person office, yeah, yeah, what yeah. was your role out of the five? Well, I was, uh, you know, just a young engineer, and uh, I wound up probably doing about half of the drawings for the Space Needle construction, and a good chunk of the calculations, and I... Think back and I said, Jesus, you know, two years out of college and Manassian was, you know, giving me these pro this project to work on that much. And today I look at the drafting that I did back then and I say, I was good. <laughs> I can see why he gave me the work because... Were you good because of your training and your skill? Or were you also good because you understood the importance of the project? Um, I mean, did you know, I, I should back up and ask, were you aware at the time that you were designing an icon? Oh, yeah, we had a pretty good idea that this was, this was a major structure. And we were pretty excited about it. And um, I never, I always considered myself like a, a C student you know, just an average student in college. And when I look back at my grades, I was a B student. I wasn't, you know, I was a little better than, than a C student. But uh, I didn't think of myself as being particularly more brilliant or than anybody else that I worked with. What I did find in, when I worked in Southern California is that the education that I had was top notch that I, I could compete with anybody. I couldn't take, didn't have to, you know, take a back seat to anybody, that I, I could go toe to toe with just about anybody. And I learned drafting from an architect. The drafting I'd got, I learned at school was horrible. You know, I mean, it really didn't, I mean, as far as the quality of work that you put lines on paper and wind up with stuff that looks good. Um, I didn't learn that there, but I worked with the, uh, First office I worked at, there was an architect there that showed me how to hold a pencil. <laughs> and I, you know, people don't realize that it's a huge difference. You just roll that a little bit every time you go and you keep that wedge working in a drafting pencil and you sharpen it just so and uh, pretty soon you're, you know, but I dedicated myself to learning and uh, hard work 
by that way, that was the one thing we learned at Walla Walla. Um, the guy that started the department uh, at Cross, he was fantastic. Uh, we're talking about a school that had 12 graduates in my class in civil, mechanical, and electrical engineering. The, you know, the whole engineering class was 12 of us. Started out 150 students in the freshman class and they weeded out half of them every year. <laughs> I was one of the few guys to graduate in four years. So it was uh, no-nonsense stuff. And, you, and the grade, your grades were based on one-third of the, was the assignments that you filled out. One-third was on the tests during the year, little quarter, you know, bi-weekly or whatever they were, and one-third on the final exam. So you couldn't... If you, you could ace the final exam and flunk miserably if you didn't produce. So you had to do a lot of hard work. You had to put these papers in and they'd get graded on every one of them. Any of the things that you produced, were they Space Needle-like? No, not at all. Uh, just basic fundamental engineering. You know, was, um, we had a senior project that I did some interesting stuff on, but that was just something you had to do if you wanted to graduate. It had nothing to do with your grades. Um, but uh, no, it was, uh, but we learned to work really hard. I mean, you spent hours. Um, I think my senior year at college, I was also the uh, editor of the college annual, which was a huge job. And I think I probably averaged maybe four or five hours sleep a night the whole, wow. the whole senior year. Yeah. And I was struggling. To get through, but struggle, you know, I knew how, when we started work on the Space Needle, I knew how to work, <laughs> to get things done, how to make things happen. Um, so we, um, uh, there, uh, Newt Berger, uh, yes. uh, he spent a couple of days with me up here in, the, in my place here and, and, and at the Space Needle, and so he's got a bunch of stuff written about it. You know, interviewing with me and in, uh, mm -hmm. in his book on yes. the Space Needle. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, uh, the, he invited me up when they had that display on the, in the lower part of the Space Needle where the, the ramp that runs up. They had a bunch of pictures that they discovered, and so they had them blown up to a huge scale and had them all around the walk going toward the elevator entrance to go up. And so I had a little table there uh, where I had my drawings. I've got drawings here. I can, you can take a look at them here. But, um, I had them all spread out there and uh, some other stuff. And was talking to students, particularly, first of all. And um, then um, uh, one of those drawings I had, I was looking at, well, one of the pictures was showing pouring the, the footings for the Space Needle. Uh, you know, that, that footing is 30 feet deep. and. You know, they filled up the whole lot just about. And I was looking at the date on the, on the picture. And then I went back and looked at the drawing, and we were making changes to the drawing seven days before they poured the concrete. <laughs> this, that's, that's, it's hard to imagine. And... We used to look at, you know, when they were building the thing, we, we would look at uh, where they were. I mean, actual construction, the guys putting steel together, and we'd be detailing stuff 150 feet above where they were working. <laughs> <clears throat> we worked on drawings, and we'd, um, well, uh, a not unusual day, uh, John would uh, leave Pasadena in the morning and catch a the limousine early in the morning, go to the airport, catch a plane, fly up to Seattle, spend the bulk of the day with um, Al Fast and the other architects working on the thing and showing them what we've been doing and getting information. And then he'd fly back um, and catch the limo from um, the airport to our office in Pasadena. And we'd be waiting for him there. You know, we'd have of course, been working all day on drawings and so forth, but he'd get there with the latest things that we needed to change to accommodate whatever the architect needed. And uh, so we'd work till 11 o'clock at night, 
and then we'd make prints. And three sets of prints on this old Oslid machine, which is a stinky ammonia thing, you know, in the office. We didn't have Xerox machines or any kind of fax machines or anything like that. So we'd make these big drawings, we'd make however many prints we needed, and um, race down to the uh, uh, Pasadena post office, which was just a few blocks from the office there, and slather these things with special delivery stamps. And when the architect got in, into his office in the morning at 8 o'clock, there'd be a set of drawings on his desk. Overnight delivery? Overnight. <laughs> That's how we did it. <laughs> how did it feel at the time? I mean, were you, were you feeling harried, stressed, overworked, or were you delighted by the it was just exciting. uniqueness of the project? It was just really exciting. I mean, it was, it was you go to work in the morning and you, had, you knew what you were going to be doing, and it was just really fun. It was exciting the whole time. And and you can run on adrenaline, I guess, you know? Yeah, well, you're 20 some, you know, 23 years old, good grief, you know, come on, that's what you do. <laughs> so, paint me a picture of what you did, you in particular in that office with regard to the Space Needle. What, are you sitting at a drafting table and are you, you oh, said yeah. you would dra be drafting 100 feet ahead of them, so I don't know what that looks like. It's well, the drafting tables, we had, you know, the mechanical arm, type, right. you know, with the, it had a L shape so it would hold this thing and you'd click it around and mm -hmm. set it whatever angle you wanted to and mm -hmm. pencil. Um, I'll show you the drawings. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you, you saved the tools that you used for the space needle. The slide rule? Yeah. Triangle? Mm-hmm. Drafting pencils. I don't know I've still got a sand stone in here or whatever. Oh, um, pencil sharpener. Eraser. That was the most important part. <laughs> and an erasing shield. Yes. People don't have any idea what that is anymore. <laughs> but it's that not it's not used anymore, obviously. No, no, that's but you'd put that over whatever you wanted to erase, and then mm -hmm. with, and we have an electric racer usually. Mm -hmm. And so then you can erase just what's without affecting stuff around there. Right. So you can take a pretty crude eraser, and with these little shapes that are in here, you can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. erase specific little things. Now this is just one of three copies. You said you made three copies? I've got two copies of these uh, drawings. How the did original you... I, gave, I wound up with the original. And I uh, uh, passed those on to the University of Washington. I had them up here and I was kind of nervous. I was thinking, you know, some bugs are a fire and then they're gone. But mm -hmm. uh, this is the foundation drawing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, here you can see that you know seven seventeen sixty one is uh, mm -hmm. the date. Add sheets, blah blah blah. There's a, I think there was another one that came out after this. But anyway, I was looking at these dates. Um, of change, we added some rebar into the, the in here, and uh, see this is. Number four here, reinforced length. I forget where that is now. But anyway, I was when I was there, I was mm -hmm. looking at. I've got another set. I think there are maybe a new set in this. But um, but this is the hand drafting that, I, and this is all my work here. Yeah, this is uh, GNC. That's me. Got it. So we had to design the foundation mm -hmm. and then, you know, 13 months later, the structure is going to be done. So mm -hmm. we hadn't even designed the foundation. They hadn't rolled the steel yet in Chicago. <laughs> this is, 
The legs of this are 36 wide flange 300s. And what that means is that they're 36 inches deep, so it's a big steel beam, and it weighs 300 pounds a foot. So that was the biggest thing in the steel book at the time. And so John said, we need to order a lot of those. <laughs> and then we'll figure out how to make them work. <laughs> Is it, this, can you somehow characterize how unusual this was as far as a, a speedy timetable? A project of this size doesn't usually have this kind of rush, correct? Right, yeah. yeah. Well, some of the stuff on the, on the space program was Which, pretty tenuous, you know. I mean, because uh, you're looking at dates when the launch is supposed to happen and somebody's supposed to go to the moon. And you start looking at the stuff that needs to happen along the way. The intermediate deadlines, yeah. Yeah, and Manassian had worked on that gantry, the rolling gantry that was a big, huge, it was 350 foot tall, mm -hmm. and it rolled over the site there. And then when they finished assembling the rocket, then it rolled out of the way and they fired it off. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuff. I mean, our crew had been working on that stuff. I didn't work on that. That was a little before I started work there. But hey. so the, you know, John was used to that kind of stuff that um, you didn't, you didn't mess around, you know. It was, and, a, it was a challenge and it was an exciting one. Yeah. Well, there's another thing too, is that um, when we were uh, talking with some of the students and uh, with, for the, um, uh, this 50 year anniversary, you know, so, so I was involved with uh, several other engineers. Some of those have died now since then. I was one of the youngest ones at the time, so I survived <laughs> the pe most of the people I work with. But, um, um, where was I going with that? Um, we were talking about the timetable and we were talking about, um, Oh, the, 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 what we were doing in design, the, the professors were trying to talk about how exotic this work was. Exotic. And refined, you know, these shapes and all this stuff that we were breaking new ground and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's not what we were doing. What we did was brutal. I mean, it was a beautiful design, but we didn't have time to do a refined analysis of stuff. We had to, you know, if, if you found out that a quarter inch plate was gonna, you know, probably be about right, use three eighths, five sixteenths. You know, don't, you didn't skimp on anything. If, uh, if 50 bolts made a connection, what 75 went in. Um, you know, there was no time to start trying to figure out how can we save some money on this thing. Saving money wasn't the point. Getting it done on time was the point. So I say it was just brutal. We, we just threw the steel at it. Um, the budget, you probably could have, at this time, the, back then I think the Space Needle cost maybe $3 million to build, something like that as I recall. At one time somebody said, well, you know, there's a million dollars more steel in there. Than, yeah, there probably was. Maybe, maybe not that much, but if you went and designed it today and started doing, being careful and trying to save some money on the thing, you could have taken a lot of steel weight out of the thing. That wasn't what we could do. If the, if the space needle opened six months late, the fair's over. <laughs> so, you know, we had to, we just had to produce. Um, Here you can see the, the base plate and the anchor bolts. Remember, these guys are, mm -hmm. let's see, these, um, okay, these guys are eight foot long anchor bolts go down in there. There's, um, oh, that's for the center core. The anchor bolts for the main legs. Okay, what were those things? That's gotta be almost 20 some feet long because this is 28 feet to that base and then the base is a little above that. So you can see these anchor bolts are, I don't see an overall length on them, but they gotta be like 20, gotta be at least 25, 28 feet long. 
and they stick up above the base. You, you can stand around the base now and see the, how that, those anchor bolts, they're four inch round anchor bolts with big nuts on them like that. And they've got slip shear plates welded all the way around them, mm -hmm. all the way up. And this is the needle as it goes further up? Yep. These are sections on the different plans as they go up. And then, of course, the two views. One a section, one kind of a interior view. And this is all pencil on vellum paper. All freehand stuff. Well, the lettering is all freehand. Of course, mm -hmm. we use triangles and so forth to draw all of the. As sophisticated mechanical drawing as you could get in those days. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And yeah. you never left the office in Pasadena. I mean, you, you didn't come up to Seattle. No, no, I, I think I came up one time during construction because I had a vacation or something that I came up and uh, while it was under construction. And then I didn't come up again until it was all done. And But John was the one... He would go back and forth, yeah. We were, we were working our butts off. Right? And no. did, did he take photographs of the progress? Uh, not so much. He didn't have time to play around with that sort of thing much either, you know. <laughs> he was... <laughs> negotiating, talking to people, and you know, making things happen. I think what happened, I'm not, I can't say this for sure, but uh, my suspicion is that John Graham and Company's engineers had already pretty much figured out how this thing was going to be built and how it went together, and I give them a lot of credit for that. But I think there were the investors and the bank that was putting up the bulk of the money to build this thing said, um, to the architect, we think you should have an engineer that knows towers to do this, because uh, Graham had done this building uh, in uh, Hawaii that had this rotating restaurant. So that's where he had all that, knew all of how his crew knew how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But as far as the towers concerned, they had building experience, but they didn't have real tower experience. So I, th I think the banks told them that they should find an expert. Well, the only expert on the West Coast was our office. Nobody else worked on towers to speak of. Uh, there were probably some East Coast. Towers. And what are the factors you have to consider when you're talking about a tower? Um, understand wind loads, seismic, um, and um, uh, construction at that elevation. Is How do you put stuff together? And, make things that can be built. You can draw a lot of fancy stuff and if you can't build it, why? <laughs> you got a problem. So you got to work with uh, Pacific Car and Foundry was the um, group and they were fantastic. I mean, they really, they really did an incredible job building that thing. Uh, these upper legs, right in here, they're constructed of, uh, the lower part is three elements and so each one of those has to have a little bit different curve in it mm -hmm. and then this leg is different than that one because it's a mirror reflection so and then this upper part from here on up is just two legs that are welded together so that's that's a little easier except they go up and then they and they still bend off in a different direction in order to make the shape um, so there's it's surprising you look at it and it looks like this giant sweep but the legs are there's very short parts of them that actually have a curve in them. Most of it's straight stuff. But they bent those things with uh, spud uh, uh, torches and heated up sections of the steel and shrunk it until they'd get it to fit a template. And then they'd fit them together to see if they fit. And they, they fit beautifully. It was incredible. That, that was an... That was the trickiest part, I think, for them, other than just, you know, having their little gantry that, or their gym, uh, gin pole crane that went up the center of the core to, uh, 
Was it hard for you at all to be working on this and not really seeing it go up? I mean, or... Um, or not, not really. I'm, uh, I mean, you would I just have to hear about it because you weren't seeing photos, right? Right, right, yeah. You know, we'd see a picture from the newspaper or something once in a while that would go on. But, <laughs> you know, that was... We were too busy. <laughs> there was... Um, one time I was a drawing here that come up. We're getting closer to the top? Yeah, the top house will be the last part of this. Um, these are like splices. This is an interesting drawing here. This is the center core with a stairway that goes up. Mm -hmm. And there's two stairways. They wrap around each other, so they spiral all the way up. Mm -hmm. And John came in one time, and he says, um, I want you guys to uh, draw the core like a sheet metal thing, and open it up and draw it from the ground all the way up through the top house. And I was thinking, guy, what? You know, it's, it's the same thing over and over and over again. It's going to take us a couple of days to draw this and... And if you draw this part and you do the upper part, you know, the, everything in between is whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, I want you to draw it from the bottom all the way to the top. So he said, oh, okay. Well, and when we were drawing this, we'd already built the first part of it. You know, it was, it was up in the air. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I forget how high it was, but mm -hmm. it's like, you know, this is, I was thinking, this is really a waste of time. Well, we did our thing. We mailed off the drawings and copies to the architect and a couple days later I got a call from the uh, guy that was the, kind of the super of the work in the architect's office and he said uh, you've got the the doorway coming out on the, um, the uh, Puget Sound side at the level of the uh, top house where the lobby is going to be and the lobby is supposed to be when you get off the elevators in the main lobby it's supposed to there's Mount Rainier out there we want it pointed that direction and I said I don't know anything about where Mount Rainier is or the Puget Sound or anything else you know you guys told us where the entrance was at the base and I just drew it all the way up and so you guys said here's where the door's going to be down on the ground and so if you want it to come out on the top, you'd have to shift the whole center core. You have to spin it around. And it's already under construction. <laughs> you know, it's, it's on its way. So what did he, he say? Was, he was quite perturbed by this. And it's, if you notice, when you get out of the lobby of the restaurant now, you're looking at the Puget Sound. <laughs> That was not their intent, <laughs> but but I learned something from that. But you know, sometimes you do something like this, and you might think you're wasting your time. If the architect had done this, he wouldn't have had that problem. He would have known right as soon as he got up to the top house. He would have said, "Oops, I got it wrong at the bottom," and he would have shifted it around so that then he would have accomplished his goal. And they didn't have time to correct it. Oh heavens, no. Yeah, no, it was it was already built. You know, I mean, yeah. it, once you start something like this, you can't you can't somehow or the other switch it around and do something different. It was they were committed. <laughs> and these are the different levels. There's a uh, another restaurant level now that's at one of these lower levels here. That, we built that, this base on the basis that uh, somebody could put something on there at some point in time and, and use it, and sure enough, they did. You know, I forget whether it's 20, 30 years later, they added that. Uh, that intermediate level restaurant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we put a concrete slab there just to kind of stiffen things up and see you know, it's gonna be something. And this is um, the top house. Here's the it's interesting, you call it the top house. Yep. I, is that an architectural term? I, I just haven't heard it called a top house. Um, well, that was what we call it, and the top, top structure details, but, uh, mm -hmm. um, and it, 
I mean, after I'd worked on this, why uh, one time somebody asked me, they said, have you ever done any work on a multi-story building? And I, I said, oh yeah, I have. I worked on a five-story building. The first floor was 500 feet in the air. Because <laughs> there's your five levels, you know. There's the restaurant level, there's the uh, mechanical uh, level, and then the observation level. Well, this is a kitchen level. And then the mechanical level, and then, of course, the elevator room at the very top inside that section. So. <clears throat> is part of these drawings the engineering of the rotation aspect? Um, no, we all we have here um, is where the tracks are going to run on these um, um, right here. Western Gear was designing the, mm -hmm. the, the mechanical part and the, mm -hmm. and all of that. We just provided a fin out here that that was beams went on that supported the tracks for them. Not too many buildings had that element back no. then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of stuff that was breakthrough stuff. Well, actually the size of glass that we could get at that time, you know, they were sort of maximizing that out. Um, and of course today they've replaced all of that glass with the glass you can manufacture today. You couldn't get, that, that didn't exist back then. So uh, I'm sure if the architects back then could have gotten it, why they would have. Uh, same with the railings, the, the, the observation platform, there's a bunch of stuff up there. The remodel that they've done of it, um, I don't think they like to call it a remodel. I forget what they like to call it. There's a, a re term. refreshing or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, they're uh, uh, they're pretty excited about that, but uh, that, and that's pretty neat. And of course, the glass floor and in the, in the uh, that's the rotating. big uh, attention getter. Yeah, that's some some people can't even stand on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you watch people walk around up there though, and even myself, you know, I, I used to have, when I was working on this, I had a great fear of heights. It was pretty awful. Um, and then... Um, As a 23 year old. Yeah, yeah, I, I really was uncomfortable, you know, get very up, far up a ladder and I didn't like that. Um, and then um, I was telling about the bridge design. Well, we did the um, Queensway Bridge it's on Magnolia Street in uh, Long Beach, and that's a 350-foot clear span, 1,500-foot bridge. No, it's clear span. I think it's maybe more like 500. Um, but anyway, it's a, um, a long span bridge, and we won the prize, the top prize for beautiful bridges in the country that year for uh, 68, whatever it was. But uh, when we were doing that, I went up to uh, San Mateo to look at a bridge that was under construction up there in the, um, with the superintendent. I'm walking along and he's, there's a manhole covered there out in the middle of the bridge. And it's, you know, it's a five lane or six lane bridge. And he's walking along. He says, you want to go down on the catwalk? And I'm sure, you know. So he goes over to one of these manholes and climbs down a ladder. And I follow him down there and I step off the ladder and I'm on a, catwalk that's 350 feet off the water and the ra it's under con the catwalk is under construction so there's a railing on one side and the other side is wide open and um, all of a sudden I was exposed you know <laughs> and then um, uh, another time that summer why uh, John took me up the uh, Sacramento Tower which was a 1500 foot tower and elevator that goes, it takes you up to the top. It's a little tiny 12 foot square or rectangular triangular uh, platform. And you know, it takes you about 15, 20 minutes to get up to the top. And again, there's catwalks going around up in there and you're 1500 feet in the air and a plane flew by below us. <laughs> and after that, I never was afraid of heights anymore. I, did it, rock climbing, and I went up the top of my mast on my sailboat, and doesn't bother me at all. You know, <laughs> so it's a matter of exposure. You know, and so everybody should realize that, you know, if you're afraid of something, the way to uh, overcome that fear is just to do it. You know, 
um, people say, don't try to get around it, just go through it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So these drawings are rare, right? Um, how, many, how many copies of these exist? Oh, I don't know. They're not, not a whole lot. Um, and you have two sets. I have two sets. Uh, I'm sure the architect's office had a set. I'm sure um, Pacific Car and Foundry would have uh, mm -hmm. kept it in their archives. But the originals are at the University of Washington. They can make all the copies if anybody wants at this Got point. So, so this, is, this is kind of your keepsake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandkids will get a kick out of it. <laughs> when you open this up and look at these, I mean, does it make you smile? I mean, what, you, well, yeah, you, you it's think... like, like, like I was saying, you know, I look at this and I, I think that's my lettering. See, this is Tom Moon and I, He's mm -hmm. an ar he was an architectural student that worked for us as mm -hmm. a draftsman. And, you know, this, this was either written, drawn by Tom or myself. I can almost look at the letters and tell which ones Tom did and which ones I did. Um, but, and I, I wound up being in charge of most of this top house work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've got a set of calculations I'll show you here too, that um, I was designing all of the sizes of all of these beams and this, this fin that comes out here and these trusses and what size members to put them in. All that stuff was all stuff that I got to do. So that was, that was pretty exciting, you know? <laughs> So it's a different, I mean, you must have gone up in the needle soon after it was opened. Um, yeah, during, I think it was like June, we came up to go backpacking in the Olympics and uh, uh, spent, uh, you know, three or four days at the World's Fair and, of course, went up the Space Needle. And well, what's it like, I mean, a, a tourist is one thing, but what's it like for an engineer to go up the Space Needle that you designed or, or that you engineered, I should say? Um, well, you know, it was funny. I remember the, the first time when, I, when we drove around there and looked at it, and it was almost anticlimactic. The excitement was this, doing these drawings. To walk around and look at it, it's like, yeah, there it is. We did it, you know. But the real excitement was the months and days that you spent doing these drawings. That was, it was a big difference. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I'm still proud of it, you know, of course. But um, uh, this was this was exciting stuff. Look at these drawings today. You know, and you could build the space needle again if you took these drawings. You could give them to somebody and say, "Go and do it just like this." <laughs> <laughs> you could build a replica. Yep. Well, you'd have to produce the shop drawings. That's. Mm -hmm. There was a huge stack of shop drawings that I also turned over to the hmm. uh, Washington University. The UW. Cause, yeah, he, um, uh, John kept all that stuff. And when he died, his son uh, called me up and said, you know, I don't know what to do with these, you know. He said, uh, I said, well, you know, I'd be happy to take them and then I'll figure out something, you know. You don't want them just to uh, be put in a dumpster or something. So after I got them, I had them for a little while here, and I thought, you know, I, I don't, I feel, don't feel comfortable keeping these things here in the house if there was a fire or uh, the silverfish went after it or <laughs> something, they're going to be gone. So, uh, talked to, oh, and of course, I was working, I wasn't working for them, but I was volunteering and stuff with the uh, Space Needle Corporation. Neat bunch of people, the yeah. family that still owns it. Um, the, they're admirable what they what they've done with this. I'm I'm really impressed. Where does the Space Needle fall in your career in terms of important, significant projects? Um, yeah, well, it's it's the most dramatic that people know most about. But um, like I say, we did this bridge in Long Beach that uh, uh, came in under budget and uh, with no change orders, and so I was pretty proud of. I, Really proud of that because mm -hmm. uh, that was a competitive bid kind of situation. Guy F. Atkinson uh, was the prime contractor on that, and Murphy Pacific did the steel work on that. And that was the only project that went through the city of Long Beach that had no change orders. The attorney for the city had never heard of the project, <laughs> and it was the biggest project that they'd done in the city in a long time. 
then um, I worked on the, uh, on the engineer record for the dome that was over the Spruce Goose. So I worked with Tim Kaur, and we developed the first computer analysis that had ever been done on a geodesic dome. And uh, Don Richter was a protege of Buckminster Fuller, and he was working at Timcor. Timcor picked up that work um, from Kaiser. And um, so all of their geodesic domes came out of that. Well, they hired, when I was working at Manassians, they hired uh, us to um, do the structural, to do a, a, an analysis of a dome, which had never been done. Mm. Um, it's way too complex by hand, and finally there was starting to be uh, computer technology that could start to deal with numbers that big. And so we put that together. Um, and then I've been down there three times because of settlement issues on the, on the dome that was at the South Pole. Um, then the conversion of the, the dome when they pulled the spruce goose out, that was pretty exciting because we opened up a huge hole in the side of it and rolled the plane out. And I was involved in that. Um, that was on my own after I'd left Manassian, so. Um, and I played architect, designed a number of homes, and this one, and uh, building another one a couple doors over here. But, um, that, this is fun. <laughs> and you ended up not too far away from the Space Needle. Yeah, yeah. How long have you lived on Guimas? Oh, we bought the place, um, 93, so 25 years ago, something like that. Wow. And my wife passed away a couple of years ago, and so huh. I'm starting over with another partner and uh -huh. okay. built a smaller place because she played the piano and was into uh, weaving and big kitchen and entertaining and so forth, which uh, I don't need anymore, so. <laughs> <clears throat> on, on to the next chapter. Yes, yeah, yeah. Are you surprised in any sense that the Space Needle has endured as, in terms of its appeal to the public and its symbol as, uh, of the city? I mean, well, to anybody outside of Seattle, Seattle is the Space Needle. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the city had the foresight to build this cone of silence around this, the Space Needle so that nobody could build up around it because if that were downtown, it'd just be another structure with all of these big high-rise buildings around it. Now, the people that own property around there might not be all that happy that they can't build up around it, but that's the way it is. Uh, they've, they've done a fantastic job to preserve their, their icon. Uh, it could have disappeared. And most buildings are designed for a 50-year life. Um, you know, that after 50 years, they should have paid for themselves. There should be something else coming along, tear the old one down, build a new one. Um, but that one's going to be there for another 100 years, it looks like. Easy. <laughs> well, it sounds like the, uh, the, the spare no cost approach is bolstering that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, another thing that happened was kind of interesting. The, um, uh, I don't know exactly what all was going on, but they... Um, they came up with the idea that we should be designing this for a 60 mile an hour wind, as I recall. And John came into the office and he says, um, the architects and the experts in Boeing wind tunnel stuff and everything says we should design this for a 60 mile an hour wind. He says, that's not enough. He says, I want you guys to go figure out what, um, what a seismic coefficient would be that would be equivalent to a 100 mile an hour wind. So, the seismic coefficient in Seattle at the time was like 10%, which is, you know, nobody'd had any big earthquakes up here. And so we went and we ran backwards and we came back and we said, eh, it's, it's like a 30% seismic coefficient, you know, for the mass of the structure that would give you the, the wind load that you want. And he says, okay, that's fine. And he said, well, they'll never buy that up there. And he says, that's all right. He says, I'm, I, I'm a graduate of Caltech and the Richter scale and all this stuff came, you know, all this earthquake work came out of there. And so he was going to bluff his way th through. But we were really designing for wind load, and we designed for uh, outrageous seismic coefficient. And um, 
within, I think, like six months after the Space Needle was built, they had the Columbus Day storm where they measured 110 miles an hour on the top of the Space Needle. And now we've got this Cascadia event which says that the earthquakes in Seattle are going to be a lot bigger than what anybody ever thought they were going to be back in that time. So it, it should be pretty obvious that the, if you want to be in the safest place in Seattle during an earthquake, probably the top of the Space Needle would be pretty good because nothing's going to fall on you. <laughs> There's some logic that people can understand. <laughs> oh boy. Well, that's that's great. Oh, these are the stats. These are the these are the calculations. And uh, what does the cover say? It says uh, structural, structural calculations. calculations. Space Needle, Seattle, Washington. Yep. <laughs> and what's sort of interesting to me is that you know here's John signing. These drawings here, and then June twelfth, nineteen sixty-one. Yep. And uh, in here, and then first design criterion GNC. <laughs> Here's this punk engineer, <laughs> whose initials are just all over these things. Uh, Jack Jones was doing some of this. Um, John Manassian did a bunch, Henry Parker Thompson, I recognize his names, but... Um, but there you are. There I am, right at the very beginning. And the top house was all mine. Mm -hmm. These are all my calculations that I did, figuring out, calculating the loads, distributing them through these trusses, and figuring out what the reactions were and how this thing would work. That um, top, there's a girder that runs all the way around at this level, mm -hmm. and it's a compression ring and tension ring kind of structure, so that it, that's sort of interesting, a novel way of distributing the forces around this thing. But uh, yeah, John did a lot of this analysis of the legs themselves. Uh, I didn't get involved in that aspect of it, so. And here's these elevator brackets. This is all my work on this sheet. I look at this lettering and so well, I can't even letter like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many of us can letter no. like we used to. I look at engineers today and at the their lettering, and I'm thinking, I wouldn't hire those guys. Well, nobody learned, to, you know, nobody letters like this anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was, you know, this is all my work here on this sheet. John's lettering was more sloped. He was mm -hmm. older stuff, so. Well, what a feather in your cap for yeah. your career. Yeah, yep. yep. And at 23. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, you, you can't predict that kind of thing. Oh, no. <laughs> and and uh, you look back on the, um, the things that you do and the reasons why, and it's such a fluke. And the reason we got the, um, the bridge project in Long Beach is because N follows M in the alphabet. And the reason that that's important is that John Manassian was in the line, they were, they, they were gonna pass out licenses of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, engineering licenses, and he was getting his, either his civil or his structural license, and so they lined everybody up so that they could pass these things out. And he had a tap on his shoulder, and he turns around, and there's a short little guy there, and introduces himself, he says, uh, I'm Marty Nishkin. Well, Manassi and Nishkin, they're a couple of Armenian guys, so immediately they strike up a friendship. Well, Nishkin turned out to be a mechanical engineer in Long Beach who, through political connections, eventually wound up being uh, a supporter of uh, Pat Brown, the governor. And it, he was in Long Beach, his office was in Long Beach, and he wound up getting huge contracts from the state of California <laughs> for, 
for all kinds of things. And then uh, he got a bridge project in Long Beach. Well, uh, there's a, um, uh, an outfit in uh, Moffat Nickel in Long Beach that does bridges all over the world, all over the United States anyway at the time. And a big bridge company, I mean a structural engineering firm that just does bridges right in the city. And Nishkin, a mechanical engineer, winds up with a bridge project. And so he calls up John and he says, I've got this project here I want you to take a look at with me, you know. And John comes down there and is looking it over and he wants, Nishkin wants John to be the structural on it, you know. And John has said, wait a minute, wait a minute. How, how, did, how did you wind up with this thing? He said, I want to see the contract on this. You mm -hmm. know, they, they don't give these contracts to just anybody. Mm -hmm. And John's looking at the contract and Nishkin had written in Manassian's name on the contract for the structural engineering and he hadn't told John. And John said, wait a minute. <laughs> if, if I'm gonna be responsible for that, I'm gonna have my own crew running this whole aspect of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Nish says, fine. So John, we were in Pasadena and John says, Gary, I want you to go down to Nishkin's office. We're gonna cut his drafting room in half. We're gonna build a wall right through the middle of his drafting room. And here's a spot in the back there. We're gonna build an office there for you. And we're gonna hire everybody from scratch because I don't want any of Nishkin's guys working on this. We're gonna have to hire everybody. So I went down there and started hiring people and again, it was a kind of a uh, rapid production project, uh, $15 million job, a lot bigger than the Space Needle. Uh, uh, eight approach structures, the main bridge, um, all the foundations, all this stuff, and over the Los Angeles River, which doesn't sound like much, but down there it is. Um, and um, so I went down there and moved, moved from Glendale to uh, Long Beach and rented a house on the beach and <laughs> started putting a crew together. <laughs> All because N follows M. Yep. If, N, if, if it they hadn't had not been that, met, they, those guys might never have met and I would never have worked on that project. <laughs> it's funny how things work. One other thing, too, since you're a writer, mm -hmm. uh, while I was uh, I, uh, in my freshman year at Walla Walla, mm -hmm. um, I, I went to Benson Polytechnic in uh, uh, Portland. And uh, so that was, you know, there's no foreign language taught there when I was there. So when I went to Walla Walla, I was going to be an ornithologist. I was interested in birds and biology and all this stuff. So um, there I am in the registration line looking at what I'm going to have to do to take my biology courses. And I realized that I've got it. I don't have any foreign language, and you have to have two years of high school, and then you get two years of college. But if you don't have the high school stuff, you got to make it up in order to graduate. And I'm looking at it. I said, I got to have four years of foreign language. I said, I don't want to do that. And so I switched to engineering in the in the registration line. They had a course called architectural engineering, which I was interested in. So I thought I'll take that. Well, before I graduated, they stopped that program and they said, could you please switch to civil engineering? You're the only student in this and it's really not that good a thing. You should be taking full on engineering. So I did. But as a, partly of, as a result, why my English um, uh, classes weren't that strong uh, at Benson. And so I got put in the, not the bonehead English class, but, and not, but not the top English class. There was a middle English class that was taught by John Waller. And John was, uh, guy, he was a great guy. He would give us an assignment on uh, Monday to write an essay and turn it in on Friday. So we would write this essay and I'd turn it in on Friday and then Monday morning he'd give it back to us and he would have bled all over it. I mean, there are paragraphs criticizing each sentence that you wrote there. So I'd rework it and turn it in, you know, you'd spend a week rewriting this thing, putting it together better, and, and turn it on Friday, and Monday morning you'd get it back, and it would be bled all over again. So we'd rewrite it and turn it in, and you'd do maybe four essays in a quarter, you know, and you worked your butt off on that. And 
As a result, I learned how to think on paper. So when I'm working for Manassian, he comes in and he says, uh, we're going to do this, this tower collapse. We're doing the study on it, trying to figure out how it happened. But we need to write a report for the uh, attorneys to describe our logic and so forth. And he said, who wants to work on the writing this thing? Well, engineers don't want to do writing. So none of the guys in the office, you know, I'm looking around and I said, well, you know, I kind of like, like that. I'll, I think I could probably do that. So I wound up writing the report and I learned how to do that pretty well after two or three of these things that we worked on. But pretty soon, what I didn't know was that when you write the report, you're, you, I learned that you write the conclusion first. Write anything. It doesn't matter. Just write down a conclusion and then try to prove it. And then you've discovered that, well, that doesn't work, so you've got to change that and this doesn't work. So I'd write down something and I'd say, well, um, John, I need to have uh, some calculations done that are going to demonstrate this. And so-and-so, I need something else. And pretty soon I'm running the office. And pretty soon John recognizes that I'm running the office. So he decides that he needs a general manager. Well, I guess who it is. It's the guy that's been telling everybody what to do anyway. So I tell, when I talk to students, I say, uh, I don't care what major you're in or what part, but when you go to college, get yourself a really good freshman comp writer, uh, teacher. Not necessarily the guy that's the head of the department or whatever, just get something that's gonna make you work to learn how to write. If you can't communicate, you know, you're going to wind up being on the lower tier all the rest of your life. Anyway. <laughs> That's a good life lesson. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it isn't just a matter of luck, you know, that played an awful lot of part in it, but uh, being willing to um, take on that, you know, just have the guts to expose yourself to that. When Tim Core wanted somebody to go to the South Pole, they didn't want to take one of their guys out of their office production work and so forth, and I was independent, and they said, hey, we've got a problem down at the Antarctica, right at the South Pole, you know, this dome you worked on, would you go down and take a look at it? Gee, do I have to pay to do this, or are you gonna, you're going to pay me to do this and fly me down there and everything? <laughs> Another sign s signature experience in your life, I oh, mean, yeah. to go to the South Pole. Well, you're right, and one thing leads to another, leads to another. It's yep, yep.